اطلب العلم اخيف هو درب به به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا very welcome وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته welcome to your turn and be so of your program out of ignorance today we have a special special guest and we will not reveal the actual identity of the guest for reasons that you will find out inshallah it's very very interesting uh, but I have to say I had a conversation with this brother earlier and through our conversation I realized that I thought I was tested before but I wasn't really going through much to be honest you know so if you can introduce yourself Assalamu alaikum uh, my name is Musa uh, I'm from Dublin and I converted to Islam when I was 16 in 2015 MashaAllah How old are you now? So, How old are you now? 21 MashaAllah So I know Musa from a long time ago but Musa unfortunately blanked me for a year and a half <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens. Um, I was going through a bit of a rough time when that happened. Yeah, Achi, I want to ask you a question. What made you interested in Islam? Uh, I always had an interest in religion, in God and how we got here, but I never really put an emphasis on it when I was a kid. You're just raised as a Catholic, and that's how it is in Ireland. You, do, you know, you do your communion, your confirmation. You don't really pray or anything about the church unless it's a funeral or you know something baptism or something like that. But I got into secondary school, and in my secondary school, the year I went in, there was a lot of uh, Muslims that were in the year, uh, but there was obviously fights, obviously, between the Irish and the Muslims, just for stupid things. But when I got into fourth year, uh, I noticed you, because you were a bit, you know, back in the day, like... Dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit what? You're just a bit, like, mad. That's the only way I can put it, like, you're just a bit mad. Um... But I was looking at you and you changed a lot and I was like, hell, wh wh what's happening there, man? And then uh, you were you had, you had were having a conversation with, you know, Ahmed one day and uh, I kind of was listening in and just to be an annoying is, fella that I was. Is, is this the one you're talking about, the bus? Yeah. When you speak on the bus? Yeah, you, they were talking, basically he was talking about something, oh, would I say what it was? Or? Yeah. It was about uh, the skills bringing in the education for the LGBT thing, you know, uh, the okay, it's okay and all that oh. campaign basically pushing the stuff down kids throats at that age and uh then just to be me just to annoy you i just decided to weigh in and go against you in a debate but you were kind of doing islamic ideals without me realizing it was islam so i went away on holidays then uh to spain that year and i was in a place called andalusia mm. and as you know from history there was a lot of there was the islamic caliphate there and one day i was just sitting out uh, on a bench in the sun and the adhan went off and I was wondering I was like what is that man and I seen loads of people leave the shop or shops they were working in or just houses and they just went straight into this building I didn't know it was a mosque like and I didn't know what that thing was and it went down my head then the next, for the next few days and then on oop, <laughs> then on YouTube uh, a YouTuber popped up everyone knows him Adam Salah and Sorry. yeah and he was doing um, a Ramadan video for fasting and stuff like that and he's a pretty outgoing character. So for someone who knows nothing about Islam and they just think it's a bunch of strict, crazy people, you know, you're not going to look at it. But when you when I seen him, I was like, oh, he seems normal enough. So I decided to just look into Islam. Uh, and I was reading through it and I was like, God, oh, this kind of makes sense. This makes sense. And then I put it off for a couple of months, just stopped looking into it. But I was sitting in class one day and Abdul Rahim, you know, him, he was in my class. And we were sitting there and uh, I just turned around to him out of nowhere. It was history class. And uh, I said, do you have a spare Quran? And he was shocked. He was like, what? A Quran? What do you want a Quran for? And I was just, oh, I'm just interested in Islam and, and everything about it. And he says, yeah, I'll bring one in tomorrow. So school ends anyway. And we're going up the road. And uh, next thing, I was like, oh, I want to do the Shahada now. And he was like, what? Are you sure and all that? And he ran through the words with me and it was done. And I said, is that it? <laughs> you know, just, is that it? And then he said, hey, yeah, you're Muslim now. And I was like, oh, cool. And he was real, like, delighted and stuff. And the next day I went in and it was prayer, Jummah prayer. You were doing the Hudvah, I remember that. And uh, everyone, the embrace I got, man, was mad. Because I was this kind of jokes that I'd say, like, jokes that were a bit out there, a bit racist, a bit ignorant. And everybody was shocked. Do you know what I mean? And I don't know about you, but most people were just like, what, you? How are you Muslim, you know? And oh, but it was great. 
and then some things happened that year and I stopped practicing because the teachers they were getting involved one in particular I won't say who it is just in case and uh I just stopped practicing for a bit and then I start practicing again and then stop same things would happen parents getting involved and my parents are really anti-Islam you know I don't think they mean to be you know racist I think it's just the cultural difference they think Islam and they automatically think you know Syria Pakistan all yeah, these yeah, kinds of yeah, places yeah. Yeah. and they're getting the culture mixed up with the religion and I've tried to explain it to them before but they freak and it got so bad to one point where it was just they threw out all my Islamic books, burned me Quran, all that kind of stuff. So I just stopped practicing completely. And then... But how did you pray, if you don't mind me asking? How did I pray? How did you pray, like, under yeah. that pressure? So I go into my room, but there was no lock on my door. So right. I couldn't lock it. So I'd go in, and I'd just be right up against the door. And I'd just kind of have me heel against the door, just in case they'd open. And if it happened, I'd just have to stop praying and just um, move the mm. mat out of my way, as if nothing was going on, like... But uh, I tried to tell them at one point that I was Muslim. I came home, I was like, you know, uh, I've been researching Islam. I want to convert. Uh, I didn't even say I want to. I said, I've already done it. And they freaked. They said, you're not one of them. You know, you're Irish. That's what they kept going through. You're Irish, you're Irish. And uh, my dad got drunk that night and kept talking. Jesus is your Lord. We had a proper debate. Like, But uh, that was when I was in sixth year, when I was trying to practice again. And same things happened. Just parents getting involved, freaking out. And I wasn't able to practice again. You know, um, and I put it off when I left school. Um, I, ju I just ignored it, like I just ignored religion. And then I did get back in contact with you at one point, and I tried to practice religion again. And I was doing it, and I was just happy, like you know, no, not bothering me. I was working. Away. Musa, but yeah. <laughs> um, when you started practice, when you like the phases you went through, yeah. when you started practicing and you stop practicing, what would bring you back? What difference would it make when you practice and you don't practice? Well, I know, I knew, you know, when you know the truth, you know the truth. And the problem is when you're not, when you don't know the truth, so you don't know anything about Islam, you're never going to think about it. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to put it down to, ah, oh, I'm feeling bad. But when you're, when you're out there embracing the truth and you know it, and you're out there practicing, you know the feeling you get from doing uh, Fajr, you know, Zuhr, Asr, all them prayers and stuff, and reading the Quran, listening to it, you know, going to the masjid, all these things, and just making dua mm -hmm. and, you know, knowing that Allah is there for you. You know, you, you, when you go away from that and you're doing bad things, which I've done, uh, you just, you have that nagging feeling and you're embarrassed at yourself and pretty much ashamed. You're like, what am I doing this for? There's no, like, what, what's the point? You know what I mean? And it got so bad to one stage where when I fell away for the for that last time when I completely blanked you for a year and a half, I started uh, doing music and stuff like that, you know? Uh, and I don't mean like rap or anything like that. I mean Irish traditional music. <laughs> And I was performing and stuff like that. And I was going out to a lot of pubs and I started hanging out with people that I shouldn't have been hanging out with that I did hang out with in school. And that led me to, you know, drink, you know, drugs, stuff like that. Just searching for something to make me happy and money and all that. But money would go, mm -hmm. you know, you just you just go and drink or food or something like that. It's, it's not really bringing much to your life, you know, whatever clothes, whatever you have. And you're just there like sitting up at night. I remember sitting up at night and you just be there thinking to yourself, what am I doing, man? What's the point? Like, and it got so bad to once at, at one stage where I just, you know, was getting depressed, man, all the time. But uh, I was trying to practice, and stuff happened again, and that's where I completely went off the rails. I remember uh, you were gonna get married. If you don't mind that's, asking, that's about when that. it went down. That's when I went off the rails. Because I remember at the time you were gonna get married, things were working out pretty well at the time when I was talking to you. I remember things were working yeah. out very well. I remember you were happy at the time, practicing, yeah. alhamdulillah, about to get married, a young married Muslim man. That's yeah. great, bro. You were doing great for yourself. Before the marriage, yeah. Do you know, when you, before you converted to Islam, yeah, you acted in a certain way, yeah? You had, yeah. You had a certain behavior. Yeah. But after Islam, you changed your behavior. Yeah. yeah your well, parents noticed that. Yeah, they did. And they, did, they didn't did, care. They no. thought it was weird. I started doing well in school and stuff like that. And I was exercising a lot more. And I wasn't, I used to, I still do, which I'm trying to give them up. But I smoked cigarettes at that age at 16, like, and I gave them up as well. And they were kind of, what's going on here? And I stopped hanging out with certain people. And I was hanging out with Hudayfa and a lot of other brothers. And that freaked them out as well. And then. Were you, were you kinder? Were you, like, to your parents? Oh, no, I was great. Yeah, I was perfect to my parents. I was respecting them. Like, it's only after they forced me not to practice 
that I started becoming a little bit of a tyrant to them, you know, yeah. going out party and all this kind of stuff and coming home and if they'd say something, they'd just be like, would you ever, you know. Just but did they not appreciate the fact that you were more minor to them? Because you know Islam places yeah. a lot of emphasis on treatment of parents. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Train your parents the correct way. Did they not realize that change? No. I tried to explain it to them. I, I've I explained everything, not just the religious aspect, but how you treat your parents, how you treat your family, you know, how you act in general, the way of the mannerisms. But to them, it's what they see on the media. And you're not going to change their views because it's what they've grown up with. Do you know what I mean? And it's just, it's, so yeah, it's a bit disappointing. disappointing you know? did, you, did you do more of telling them than your actions? Like, no, I done both. I was acting and I was telling them. Whenever they'd, I'd come home, they were like, I hope you weren't with them, you know, mad so-and-so. And I'd be like, yeah, I am, and blah, blah, blah. And be comfortable, bro. Say whatever yeah. you want to say, you know what I mean? And they just, they, they'd freak out and they wouldn't, you know, they'd just be disappointed. Or not disappointed, they'd just be angry, like. Yeah. And I'd be trying to show them, you know, through my actions, but it just doesn't work. And that's the way they'll always, that's yeah. the way they'll always be. Do you think, uh, like, obviously, you know your parents love you, yeah? Yeah. But do, do you, uh, are they, do you think they're justified in you be, being afraid of you getting in the wrong crowd with what to see in the media? No. You don't think they're justified? No. That I think they're just ignorant. I think, I, I'm not sure, but now that when you're saying it, I'm kind of trying to visualize it. I think it's, they're scared of what they don't know. Yeah. You understand what I'm trying to say? Do you think like, if we got to know them, they say we got, they got to know us on a personal level. Yeah, we, that perception tried, change. Have you ever tried to inter- uh, uh, yeah. choose your friends? Yeah. I've had, I had good friends as well. There was a fellow I was friends with, he's real sporty. And real well mannered, like never disrespectful. I'd hang around with him a lot, and we went to do charities and stuff like that in in town. Like we do it a lot, and I was trying to show them, like you know, this is the type of friend I need, and uh, they couldn't see past his race or religion, no matter what. And that was the bad thing about it, you know. They like none of my parents or my siblings have any friends that are not white, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not like trying to say, oh, yeah, they're horribly racist. Or yeah. they, I don't think they mean to do it. But it's just the way they are, and there's no change in them because everything they read and all that. Do you know what I mean? Even if I try and push it, they fight back, yeah. and it just turns into a row. What was it like when your stuff were thrown out? Like, I can't, did they just grab the stuff? Oh, yeah, they just out, they like, came. And- out. So what happened was I came home from the mosque one day, and my ma had been rooting in my room because she knew she 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 was getting suspicious that I was hanging around with Muslims again, and she took all the books in front of me. Like she went up, me, her, and my dad grab all the books, the mats, and just threw them. Threw, the, threw some of them in the bin and then they were burning stuff out the back through the Quran and a few other books in the in the, in the fire. Do, do you know what this reminds me of so far? Mitch, uh, I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do they think because they say they they believe that they won't be tested? Yeah. So you probably had, your life was probably easier before Islam, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. So people say, oh, I, I accept the religion of the truth now while we still being tested. So maybe this is your test. Um, oh, one hundred percent is this test. It's a Definitely. test, but at the oh. same time, if I was to let them know, it would just jeopardize the religion again, and I wouldn't be able to practice because they would forcibly stop it. Like, do you know what I mean? And I can't move out because financially, I'm mm-hmm. not there yet. If I was, I would have no problem saying, "Hey, listen, this is what my religion is, and that's it. If you don't like it, whatever. You're still my parents." Mm. But I can't do that until I do move out one day. You know, hopefully. Like, yeah, a decent paying job and a male to Shalom. live on my own. May Allah bless you with a righteous wife, Akhi. But it's going back to the marriage topic. Yeah. Because that was that was a big thing in your life. Honestly, it was a big thing. It was a big topic in your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I remember at the time you were you wanted you were gonna move out of the country, bro. And you had everything so step. You had everything planned. Yep. One, two, three, I'm gonna do one, two, three. Yeah. And then so, things changed. That's ooh. when I stopped talking to to, to Musa. Yeah. You know? So I had I had a decent bit of money saved. And in my head, I was like, you know, I was practicing a lot and I was doing really well and I was hiding it, but it was nobody was getting suspicious because I was real careful with practicing. Like I wouldn't tell them where I was going. I just say I'm going out with these people, you know, friends that I used to hang out with years ago um, just to throw them off. Like, but I met this girl on that app, Muzmatch. Any of you ever heard of it? <laughs> right? <laughs> now, look, I have no way of meeting anybody well, yeah. you know what it I mean because I wasn't yeah. born into it yeah. but uh, I was going through and I landed on a revert and yeah. she didn't wear a hijab or nothing yeah. which didn't bother me I was like oh maybe I can make her wear it like you know kind of yeah. not make her but like yeah. Yeah. Her convince her yeah. yeah yeah convince yeah. her to wear it and uh, 
we were talking and we were getting you know and that's where you catch the feelings right you know that's yeah. where it goes haram yeah and she was like oh we should get married and i was like okay and i went over to where she lives i won't say the country or anything but i went over to where she was living and we done this thing you know oh I, she I, was in Ireland. No, no no i went abroad and just for two weeks just to do it like and then i was going to get a visa and stuff and move over fully and uh i went over and we done this thing she said we can't go to the mosque and i was like why and she goes i'm not registered at the mosque and neither are you now i'm oblivious to this i didn't understand anything i just wanted to do it like get it how old were you sorry this was about a year and a half ago so it was about 19 20 i think it was 20 and uh basically i went over and she says oh my wally's gonna do it so she had this fella that was a muslim fella and he was he done i don't know he just said a few words in arabic and then said you say yes and she says yes and then it's done and i was like okay but it wasn't i looked up what the actual nikah was it was nothing to do with what, what they were doing and uh basically i went back to ireland then and i was getting the visa and the visa went through and everything i was ready to go over had savings she said lodge the money into into her account so she can set up my stuff me being a tick um. i gave her my savings and then that's when she blanked me said mm. you know i don't really think this was right and all that and i'm not i don't think i want to be part of the religion anymore and all this kind of stuff and i freaked out i called you straight away man i was mm-hmm. in a panic when i woke up and it wasn't about the money or anything it's because i had feelings for her yeah. and then that happened so that's what that happened then i went off the deep end subhanallah you definitely catch feelings bro because mm-hmm. i remember you you were so close to that family like i remember you were telling me i, I hope you don't mind me giving these oh, details God. she w- she had a son yeah and that son was talking to you and got attached to you. Yeah, yeah, he's you know calling I mean? me that. There you go, bro. Like, of course they're going to catch feelings. You know what I mean? Someone that's on the same boat as you. Someone who's a revert who converted to Islam. Mm. Why wouldn't you catch feelings, bro? Yeah. You get me? Like, you had your whole life set up. But when you say that threw you off, in what way, bro? Because I know, I know a revert Muslim, uh, Shane and Blanche. Uh, I, I, he didn't tell me his story specifically, but I heard it from lads. It's to do with a woman as well. Like, that threw him off. Yeah. But Hamdan has practicing again, though. Yeah. But how did it throw you off, bro? It just put me down. It's just, you know, when you have feelings for someone, it wrecks you then. Oh, and yeah. instead of me turning to Allah, which I should have done, mm. I blamed Allah. You know, I just blamed God for no reason, like, and just turned away and just started doing stuff again that I shouldn't have been doing. Just working a certain job, which limits how i could practice anyway which was kind of messing with my man already you know i mean i wasn't spiritually good at the time it was i was all right like i was getting there and i thought getting married would have helped it and then that happened so I basically went off the rails then i started going out drinking again started smoking weed hanging out with them lads that i shouldn't have been hanging around with and that led me to do a harder drug which i only done maybe a couple of times during the time i was hanging out with them but it was cocaine and uh yeah it got it got to that stage and i was getting depressed real depressed and i remember going to amsterdam you know for this trip thing and i done a psychedelic drug over there and that freaked me out i was freaked i looked in the mirror and i was seeing stuff that I sh- that would scare anyone yeah. but it wasn't like you know mad shapes or anything i seen the abyss in my own face like do you know what i mean but i think that was my own psyche saying you're acting this way yeah. and i panicked and i ran under the sheets and stuff like that in my room and I threw the covers out of my head and I was just freaked, man. And uh, then after that, I dropped it down my head again. I said, I'll put that to the side, man. That's, you know, don't think about religion. And I went home and I was happy again for a few weeks. Started a new job. And I was working away. And then it gets to January, February time there. Just start of the year. And I got to the stage where the depression started to hit again. And I was getting suicidal. And I had already attempted suicide the year before. Not attempted. I didn't actually go through with it. But I had the intention to do it. I went down to these woods near me with a rope tied around my neck tied around the tree and i was sat sitting on the branch and something inside me was just like you know it kept telling me, i kept wanting to do it i was looking at it, i was crying my eyes out i wanted to jump i wanted to just end it and then something inside me was just like nah there's no need to do that man just get off the tree just go through with it you not not go through with the suicide like go through life like so i got off the tree and then i was grand that was in between say october of last year to november was that bad period and then it went away for a bit and then it came back in march february march and i went to a trip to america and i was all good i was all happy and i was chilling but i was overweight like i got to like 20 stone 21 stone and mm. uh, i'm not to losing a good bit anyway mm. but i was so depressed and suicidal that i remember getting home from america and just sitting in a corner in the in the bathroom like just sitting down on the floor crying man 
and I was looking at a bottle of bleach and I picked it up, I opened it and I was two seconds, like I literally picked it up to go for it. I was about to just neck it. And again, something just came in my head and was like, nah, don't do it. And I, I came out of the bathroom that night and I was just like, I'm going to change. I'm just going to do something different. And I tried to do it by just getting healthy, you know, so, oh, I'm going to exercise now, you know, change my psyche, change my mindset, pushing religion away, just forgetting the saying, because I was embarrassed. Like I didn't want to reach out to any of you, like to you or any of the other Because I remember I tried to look for a Musa. He was gone. He disappeared. It's like he, he doesn't exist anymore. You know what I mean? Like Musa, I, I wanted to get you to Musa on social media. Yeah, I, I I deleted all the social media and it wasn't because I, was, I didn't want to talk to anybody. Because I was embarrassed with the way I was acting. Mm. I couldn't call myself a Muslim with the way I was acting. I was ashamed. like, And I didn't think anyone, and I know it's the shaitan whispering in my ear, but I didn't think anyone would want to talk to me or want to help me. They wouldn't want to be my brothers. Like, they, you know, they'd just say, oh no, you're not Muslim, you're kufar, go away. But you see, the thing is, as a Muslim, no one knew hanging around with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I look down to you for sins that you do, the, the, I, I, I'm going to be held liable. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's a sin in itself. I shouldn't look down on you. I should feel bad. My obligation is to help. Know, Do you understand yeah. what I'm trying to say? It's always the shaitan man that tries to push you away from your good friends. Tries to fool you. Oh, they're not going to yeah. look down on you. What are they going to say about you? How, they, how are you going to let them see you in that state? You know what I mean? Yeah. But sorry, go ahead. You're... But yeah, so I, I was just embarrassed. I didn't want to try and reach out to anybody and I just hid from everyone. I remember I used to be panicking if I went out and I seen someone and I'd be like, oh no, is that one of the brothers? And I'd be mm. like, I'd literally go the other way just in case. I'd be freaked, like, because I didn't want them to see me like that. And there was a couple of times where I did see people when I was out on a night out, which I shouldn't have been doing, but I was doing it anyway. Um, even though I was trying to be healthy and change my mindset, I was still going into drinking just just to kind of numb, numb the pain. Not, not socialize, numb the pain inside. Because oh, yeah. it would pop up every now and again. And that was my escape. That was my release. And then I went out and... Basically, one night there, I seen two brothers that I knew, and they were talking to me for a minute, and I was like, buckled, I was drunk, and I just started talking to them, and they just blanked me, man, they were just like, oh, whatever, see ya, and walked off, like, they didn't even want to know me, and that was another part, it was like, it was just embarrassed, and, you know, and I didn't want to reach out to anybody, and then it got to, it got to, uh, say, May there, and obviously the lockdown and stuff like yeah. that, and I was sitting there one night, and it was like two in the morning, half one, two in the morning. And you know when you're rich around thoughts? Mm. And I was just getting healthier and stuff like that. But I was just sitting there. And out of nowhere, just raw depression just overtook me. And I just started crying. Again, just for no reason. And I just wanted some sort of help. And I just dove on the ground head first and just started calling out to God. like. And I didn't, you know, it wasn't, I didn't say, you know, Allah or say any prayers. I just put my head down and was just like, please help. Do you know what I mean? Bring me out of this. Like, I don't want to be like this anymore. And then just small things were happening where, little, you know, I was kind of feeling a bit happier. But every night something would pop in about Islam. And then a couple of weeks later, your podcast pops up on my YouTube feed, which it shouldn't have. For no, like, there was no things on my YouTube feed that were Islamic at all. There was stuff that oh. was really un-Islamic. And he, he would pop up and I was like, stop it, Dave. I said, nah. And I just remember watching episode one and all that. And I was like, right, I'm just going to try practice again. And I was dead inside, man. There was no feeling. I've only been practicing the last whatever, starting to practice again the last month or so. But I remember just starting to do it again. I retook Shahada, um, you know, just to kind of reaffirm it. Mm. Went in, had a shower, went out and prayed uh, Zuhr. And I just started doing it like again, kind of, I'd miss prayers here and there. But I'd keep watching Islamic reminders and stuff, getting back into it. And then Eid, I decided to uh, just make Instagram and just text him. I wanted to just say, you know, Eid Mubarak, Adaifa. And then that's how I got here now on the podcast. <laughs> just started talking again. And that's one of the duas I kept making during that month is take away those who are bad for me and give me righteous companions. Do you know oh. what I mean? I just kept saying that. And obviously, I'll turn up hard to make my heart from upon your religion. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, when I was uh, in uh, secondary school, I was... I was there wasn't much Muslims. My friends were good, uh, but they weren't like practicing. So I remember I made a dua to Allah, to do Allah, find me righteous companions. They went to UCD, <laughs> followed them. Yeah. But I want to ask you one question. Uh, do you know, in, in terms of your depression, were you really good at hiding it? Mm. Do your parents, I just nobody, no, nobody noticed? I didn't want anyone to see weakness because my dad's a real strong man. 
Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like he always taught, my parents always talk saying, oh, if you have these things, you'll speak about it. But I can't because he's my dad and he's, re- he's a real strong person. Like, you know, he's not an emotional person. He, like mm. he's not harsh or anything. Like, if he, if he has that, a few beers on him, he starts getting real philosophical. Like, But he's um he's not an emotional person. So I, I've only ever seen him cry once and that was for a death in the family. Um, But I was just hiding. I just smile every day and then go up to my room, ball my eyes out and that was it. Or just just start you know go to sleep sleep for ages in the day and just blame on a hangover or something like that or go drink smoke weed that was a big thing for a while smoking weed do you know, do you know, from what i got so from what too loud i don't know i kind of looked quick and then my neck proper hurt <laughs> i want to get one of them ones what? do you think weed is addictive what i do don't you- think the substance itself is addictive i think it's an addictive trait i think you know you pick up a habit I don't think I think it's just a, it's a mental thing. And do you believe it helped you? For the first week after that, it just became a habit. I had to do it. It's and even good. when I was smoking it, I'd go deep into my thoughts, and that would make it worse. So it wasn't really helping. It helped for one week, you know. You just you know, I'm um, snooping, like, walking around, listening to rap, you know, that kind of thing. Listen, you were saying from what I got from your story, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't touch this because it makes a lot of noise. I know you're not. Okay, from what I got, yeah, from what I got from your stories, you were like, you know, you knew you were having problems, yeah, then you try to find solutions, okay, then, okay, you try exercise, or maybe you turn into alcohol or drugs, yeah. but you knew, like, th- the real answer, you knew what you were looking for, but you're too afraid to take it. wasn't it. that I was afraid, I wasn't afraid to go towards it, it was a nagging thing in the back of my head, knowing the truth, and not doing anything about it. But it was also, I was embarrassed and ashamed of what I had been doing. Mm. And I was afraid of other people's reactions. So I was afraid, oh, what if I get caught praying? Like, and that's a mad thing, getting caught praying. Like, you wouldn't yeah. ever be worried about that. But that was in my head. What if I get caught praying? I can't even make wudu. Like, and like, I have to bring a pint of water up and for Fajr to make wudu. Just to, because the top is a pressurized top, so you can hear it through the house. Mm. So they'd, they'd be coming to check what I'm doing. And it's the same for Isha because they go to bed late uh, or early. So like, you know, that was another worry. What if they find out? And the way they reacted last time was horrible, horrible. So, you know, there was that. And then there was all the other Muslims. Ah, sure, they don't want to know me. What would they want to know me for after the way I was acting? Like, they know I was up to no good, you know? And that's that's the shaitan whispering in your head, keeping you away. But then once you keep, once you ask the way I did when I was in that bad state and I put my head in the ground and just asked, that's when it just, it's like a, a wall just gets broken down. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's in front of you and you just, there's nothing standing in front of you now. You can go and start doing it. But you start getting, when you start practicing again, stuff happens as well. Yeah. More doubts creep in. You know, I was getting bad dreams and stuff, getting weird feelings around me. And uh, then I just, just went away over time, just making dua and praying every day. The Hajjad prayer was the biggest help as well. I done that one night and made a lot of dua and that, after that, no, it was just everything was just perfect. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. Obviously, some little tests here and there. Yeah. And I know there would be bigger ones, but that was one. That was the thing that really helped as well. Alhamdulillah, I haven't missed the prayer like since I started practicing again. Oh, wow. So I'm happy with that. May Allah keep you firm, bro. May Allah keep you firm. To be honest with you, you said something to me today that really hit some strings. You were like to me, when you prayed, because you came here straight away, like, I haven't prayed Asr. Hmm. You prayed Asr. Uh, Musa prayed Asr and he was like to me bro you were talking behind me as if it was normal it was nothing he's like this feeling I haven't felt it in such a long time whenever I'm praying I'm so vigilant what if someone comes what if someone does this what if someone does that subhanAllah bro like it's I, I can't say you've yeah, experienced yeah. that bro to be honest you know what I mean yeah. and I remember I was telling him bro and I reiterated you know what I mean diamonds are made under extreme pressures and temperature and the harder the test, the better the result. Yeah. That's what we always say, bro. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says so in, a, in, a, in a Sahih Hadith, he says that the most people that are tested are the Prophets. And then the people that are below the Prophets. Then the people that are below the Prophets. You understand? Yeah. The more beloved you are to Allah, the more you're going to be tested. Because when you get tested and you persevere in those tests and you pass those tests, you're gonna, your, your level is going to elevate. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Every time in the last since I started practicing, and every time something creeps in, something like a bad thought, or you know, waking up for fajr, or even if I'm 
kind of if I'm out and I need to make it back for a prayer I'm just like I don't pull it off and I don't let the doubts mess with me I just say and I'm just like you're not getting me this time man. and that's another do I make don't don't let me go back to what you've taken me out of because I don't want to go back to that 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 to pray because I don't know if anyone has out of us here has suffered with depression yeah. or anything like that but man when it gets you especially when you're not practicing like if you turn away from god man it wrecks you because you're just in a bad place mentally when you're when you're practicing you never get the like you might get anxiety but you won't get depression like i had it because you always have god there to guide you and help you mm. you always feel that presence you feel the presence like after prayer like i was dead inside for the first say week or two of practicing again couldn't feel it when i was praying but i just kept persisting yeah. and then there was that day i done the hajj prayer and i don't i remember doing that oh man the feeling i got it was like when i first prayed when we done jumma in school yeah. uh, the day after i took shahada it was like that prayer because i remember going to matt's class after that jumma prayer after taking shahada i remember sitting in it and i was like <laughs> it's just the best feeling ever you know because i smell weed i know what that's like but it was better than that <laughs> i was sitting there i was just in class oh, i just want to chill out man i just want to sit here and relax you know what i mean <laughs> And I got that after doing the Hajj, and then I keep getting that feeling now when I pray. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, there's sometimes I have to be vigilant at home. I'm kind of, my attention's kind of going away a little bit, but now I don't really, like, I'm saying if they walk into the room, I don't care. I just don't want to make it obvious to them just in case something happens. But if it does, if they do walk in and my head's on the ground, I'm not breaking. Masala, I don't care. There's a principle in Islam is that uh, says uh, uh, that pushing away harm. It takes precedence to bring in benefit. You understand? So if you believe telling your parents or your parents finding out cause you worst harm and it could lead you, that pressure could lead you to stop practicing. You shouldn't tell them. Yeah, you no, understand? that's what I was talking to before I texted you that day. I, I did text two brothers that are prominent figures in the Islamic community, Abdurrahim Green yeah. and has anyone ever seen a Wailife SQ? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I texted him as well just for advice like if, it, if it's okay to keep it secret, you know, and what should I do? All the, you know, just a few things like, and uh, after him, Green gave me a really like, because he's a reaver as well, but he gave a really sturdy response. Just be firm. Do you know that kind of thing? Just yeah. tell them. There's no point in keeping a secret. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. if he, but then, way of life, I'll show you the, what the voice clip he sent me yeah. after. But he was just like, you know, it's okay. And, you know, I'm sorry for what you're going through. But he says, you have to understand, you're closer to the Sahaba than you know he is himself just because it's the, what i'm going like the way it's i have to hide it and stuff mm. like that that's what went they went through and that's another thing i look at when i look at the sahaba i'm like and the prophet muhammad said so, so. i'm like my test isn't as hard you know obviously it's hard in terms of modern day uh being a muslim you know or especially a revert in a place like ireland when you look at him you're like man oh, i wouldn't have been able to do anything <laughs> do what he go through what he went through yeah. And to build Islam the way it went through, I know it's all from Allah, but you know, to stand firm like that, mm. don't I don't think I'd, I would have been able to do that. Musa, you said that uh, in you know, one way to keep practicing is the to learn more about your religion. Once you learn, you move away from doubts. Yeah. yeah. You told me you recently started the knowledge club. Yeah. Yeah. How is that going? It's good. I haven't watched as much as I should because I'm kind of. I'm, Obsessed with watching the uh, Brother Muhammad Hijab on YouTube. <laughs> he is knowledgeable as anything. Yeah. I love watching. It's his debates are good, but I love watching him actually talk. You know, because yeah. he's just yeah. real knowledgeable. Like some of the words that are a bit big for me, but you know, and uh, some other guys on YouTube that I do watch. But I have been watching the Knowledge College. I don't really watch his YouTube channel, Dawa Man. So I do listen to Mufti Mank and you know them kind of guys, yeah. and it's good. So, Alhamdulillah. But see, like see. There's a hadith from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says awesome. the person in order for you to like uh, three characteristics if they were in a person he would find through them the sweetness of Iman you know what I mean and then obviously the scholars they say this sweetness is not like any sweetness this sweetness is sweeter than the sweetness of sugar you understand yeah. you know it's a beautiful feeling that only those that have felt it can explain it and I know through you you said you prayed to Hijrid and you felt that feeling. He said, three people, no, like three, if you have these three characteristics, through them you'll taste the sweetness of your man. Number one, that you love, uh, that you, when you love a man, you love them for the sake of Allah. You love a person, you love them for the sake of Allah. They're doing good. You understand? Yeah. I love this guy because he's doing good. He brings me closer to Allah subhanahu yeah. wa ta'ala. You know what I mean? Uh, 
second thing is uh, oh the first one sorry the first one is that Allah and his messenger is more beloved to him than anything else besides them that's number one number two is that when you love a man you love a man for the sake of Allah for the reasons we mentioned and the third thing is that you hate to go back to kufr you know what I mean after Allah has saved you from it just like how you'd hate to be thrown in the fire honestly speaking would you say now after seeing how it was like, you know what I mean? After, you know, stopping practicing, would you say you would hate to go back to yeah. that way? I'd hate it because it would break me again. Do you know what I mean? If I ignored God, it would just break me again. If I, if, if I ignored Allah, it would just wreck me again. And I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not letting myself go. You know what I mean? If it comes to the point that my parents do find out, which I don't want them to know until I'm stable and able to live by myself, like in that financially, like, you know, if it does happen before that, I'm just going to have to stand firm and I'm just going to say, listen, if you don't like it, I'll move out and I'll just, I don't know where I'll go, but I'll just go somewhere. So, because I'm not letting it happen again. Because it just, it, it, I'll just be gone. May Allah keep you firm, bro. Allah okay. subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever That's another away. thing I wanted to say about you. I appreciate you, bro, because all the, like, obviously I've only met my audience tonight, other, except for one lad here. Uh, he knows who he is. <laughs> but, uh, Hudayfa, uh, of all the brothers that I was friends with, a lot of them, when you're trying to talk to them again, they blank you, you know, especially when I went away from his and come back, uh, except for you and another brother, Abdullah. But you, every time I text you, what's up? As if I hadn't been gone anywhere. Just long time, how are you? Hope you're well. Do you know what I mean? You're not, you never shunned me or anything like that. But that, that never, you know, you, then I think to myself, right, so I do have a proper friend because I had friends, mm. you know, that... Uh, they were, they'd say you're, they were, oh, we're best mates and all that. But when you need it the most, they wouldn't come near you. Unless you wanted to, you know, buy them something or go out drinking or something. Yeah. But you, you just text you straight away. Yeah, uh, like that night with the, about, yeah, with the marriage thing. Literally, I called him in a panic. And I don't know what he was doing, but he just dropped everything, got Mustafa, and he was like, I'm on my way. Do you know what I mean? And we yeah. went and had a chat and stuff. Thing is, bro, that's only the obligation of a Muslim upon his Muslim brother. You know what I mean? That's only an obligation. Yeah. Like you, you might see it as something special, but that's, that's, that's the least I could do. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And that's why you should never let the shaitan creep in yeah. Yeah. and make you think like, because Allah, even, even if you're born a Muslim, it has nothing to do with being a revert. You know what yeah. I mean? Because these weaknesses, they're in every human. You know what I mean? We all yeah. share certain characteristics, no matter where you're from, what background you're from. You know what I mean? He's going to come to you. Because every one of us, even if you're practicing, you're born yeah. to a Muslim family, when you fall off the track, the shaitan is going to come to you. Stay away from these people. They might have seen you yeah. doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. They're going to judge you. If you go to the prayer room, they might say this and say that. Yeah. Sometimes, so much getting a qazah haircut, you know what I mean? Yeah. Getting like a proper tight skin fade, you yeah. know? Like, oh, don't go to the mosque. People are going to look down on you. Yeah. You understand lot, what I'm trying to say? You know? A lot of brothers as well with reverts, right? When when you, when you revert to Islam, everyone's like, oh, mashallah. They're mm -hmm. real happy. You know what I mean? Embracing you, giving you hugs and all that. Oh, come over to my house for food, all this kind of stuff. You make one mistake. And bear in mind, I was 16 when I took Shada. So I was only a kid. Like I, did. Mm -hmm. I barely knew much. But I know it was the truth. But I make one mistake. And same people that were like that they turn away Spanish. except for like you and abdullah and a few other people but most of them would be like oh here don't want to don't know him but you see the thing is that's why here we should we need to send the message to our brothers that are out there you know what i mean even the sisters especially when it comes to reverts they go through stuff they you like in, 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 you are privileged you got things your parents might be practicing your parents encourage you they want you to practice they get happy when they start mm. practicing they encourage you but other people, they may not have these privileges, you know? When you see them fall off the track, you should bring them back. You shouldn't push them away. You know, for example, I'll give you an example. There was a Sahabi, bro. He was an alcoholic. Mm. Every time he used to drink, he used to get whipped. Islamically, you get whipped eight times when, if you drink and it's known public. If you, if you sin private, your private sins shouldn't be publicized. And the one who publicized them will get, will get punished. You understand what I'm trying to say? Because yeah, yeah. it's a private sin. You understand? You know? Uh, but the point is, he used to drink. And then he used to get whipped every time. And then one of the Sahaba, they shunned him. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, don't help shaitan against your brother. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he said, he loves Allah and his messenger. Don't help shaitan against your brother. Because when you do that, shaitan is going to corner him. You're pushing him away yeah. from you. We have a saying in Arabic, it says, it says, the wolf eats the sheep that 
that move Trace. far that stray from the from the flock. from the from the flock yeah. you understand what i'm trying to say you know obviously i'm not trying to say muslims are sheep because we follow evidence <laughs> you know yeah. generally speaking we follow evidence you know um, brings me to uh, to the thing today you know uh, about evidence today alhamdulillah is one of the happiest i hate to, i hate barber i hate working as a barber bro because there's a lot of things in it that are un-islamic that's the honest truth yeah and it kills my heart when I stay working in the Bible shop for a long time, you know what I mean? It makes me slack in my prayers, you know what I mean? Certain acts of worship bring you down, bro, you know? I don't want to go into details, but these are my, my private sins. You understand what I'm trying to say, you know? But today was the best day it had as a Bible. Alhamdulillah, there's a guy, his name was Daniel today. Uh, he was the last customer of the day. We're, we're speaking about coronavirus, we're speaking about, uh, you know, how uh, they're trying to inject a chip into everyone, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, he was telling me he was doing some research about that. Then we started talking about Islam and the evidence of Islam. Bro, I was talking to him, he started tearing up. Alhamdulillah, he left, before he left the chair, Ashhadu Allah, 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 he became Muslim. So today is actually the happiest day for me, subhanAllah. Just you know? say something. Uh, for like, if you think about it now, I, was, I forgot who I was talking to, but like, we are so comfortable. We take things for granted because we were born Muslim. Mm. You know what I mean? So, like, even here in the store, you have to hide, bring water to make with you. I remember I was watching a video of Ali Dawa. He says yeah. that he has to hide because he doesn't want his dad to see him. And, like, imagine our parents are forcing us, encouraging us to pray. But if you imagine someone trying to stop you from practicing the, the, the deen and it's your own parents, that's like, I don't know how people feel. Because I remember, just to give you a nasiha, you don't, if if you do do decide to tell your parents, whenever you decide, yeah? I remember someone was telling me, this has nothing to do with Islam. He was talking about marriage, yeah? yeah? And he was saying that his mom didn't want him to marry a girl from a different tribe. A different tribe, yeah? And so one day he goes to his mom, Mom, do you want the best for me? And she goes, yes, of course, I want you the best. So do you want a woman to take care of me, to uh, raise my sons, to do all the good things? Yes, yes, I, yes, I want that for you, my son, yeah? And then he goes to his mom. So what if I find out in a woman that is in this tribe? Are you going to say no? So she goes, no. Then start thinking about it. So from that story, I just want to say, when you do decide to tell your parents, ask them. What do you want from me? Do you want me to be happy? Do you want me to live a good life? Do you want me to respect my parents? Do you want me to uh, be a benefit to society? If they say yes, and then ask them, what if I get this from Islam? You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not saying say blatantly because it's probably way, very difficult that, that I, I make it out to be. But maybe that's a food of thought. Maybe try ask them, what do, you do, what, do you, what do you guys want from me? You know what I mean? Yeah. Just what was that? The point that I was trying to make earlier when I was speaking about the, the other guy, because I remembered you were saying you were you listened to me and Ahmed yeah. on the bus, and what we started to do myself and Ahmed every time we go on a bus, we intentionally open topics and we intentionally <laughs> speak loud. <laughs> got you, right, bro. We started intentionally. We started doing that all the time. Uh, intentionally, me in. <laughs> oh, bro, we intentionally speak loud in order to get because yeah. people love these topics and it makes sense. Do you understand? Yeah. Get them to listen. And the guy that I was speaking to today, Daniel. Alhamdulillah, yeah. the guy that converted, I ask Allah Lit- Ta'ala to keep him firm. Lithuanian you know, brother, yeah? Uh, the Romanian brother. The Romanian brother. Um, uh, his name was Daniel there. So what happened is, he was telling me that he had an encounter of Muslims before I spoke to him. Yeah. And he was saying that he met them in prison in England. And he was just fascinated with, the, with how much they stuck to their religion. They knew the truth and they stuck to it. He came from a Christian background. He's like, I knew. And the Bible says you shouldn't eat pork. You shouldn't drink, uh, you know what I mean? You shouldn't, uh, Mary used to wear hijab, says you should wear a hijab in the Bible. You know what I mean? Uh, all that sort of stuff. He said, just seeing them stick to that fascinated me. And he was saying, hearing them reciting the Quran, although they didn't give him direct da'wah, hearing them reciting the Quran really touched his heart. You know what I mean? And he was saying, he used to feel something here every time he'd hear them pray. You yeah. understand? So the point I'm trying to make to whoever is listening, Prophet Muhammad SAW says, Balluhu anni walau aya. You know, mm-hmm. tell the people, about me, even if it's one verse. Because you don't know, bro. Like, see these people in prison now, or the ones that were in prison, you know what I mean? May Allah yeah. forgive them for whatever they've done and that led them into prison, you know? Yeah. Um, they don't know that this guy converted today. Yeah. Sometimes he might throw something and you don't know where it's going to bring someone. Yeah. 
Yeah. It may not affect the person right now. Maybe he thinks about it five years later, whenever he goes through a difficulty. You know what I mean? Yeah. It comes back in his head. You know what I mean? That brings and me it, to mind about, remember I was, sorry to cut you off, remember I, when I was in America, I said when I went to, on the trip. Yeah. Uh, when I met that uh, Muslim fella. Bro, tell the story because that's, that's, that story is, is deep, man. <laughs> so, like I said, I was at a bad time, but I went out drinking one night to a club when I went out, when I went to America. And I met this Muslim guy, he was with his girlfriend for her birthday. And I remember talking to him and I said, where are you from? And he said, Iraq. And I was <laughs> like, so are you Muslim? And he's like, yeah. And I said, I know a lot about Islam. I was drunk, like, and he was like, yeah, right. And I just turned around and recited Salam al-Fatiha. I, I was drunk out of my mind. I don't what know. were you saying, bro? What? What were you saying to him? Oh, I just turned around and I was like, oh, I know. He goes, no, yeah, yeah, right. I said, I do. And he goes, prove it then. And I went, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. <laughs> and I started doing the whole thing. And he was just like, he just stopped dead in his tracks. Didn't say nothing. He said, I have to go. I just walked out of the bar. Left his girlfriend on her, on her birthday. Smile, and just left. He was only about 25, I'd say. And he just left, just went. I think that's when he realized he's probably drunk and he was like, And oh I didn't really God. take much notice to yeah. when I done it, but now thinking back, I'm like, oh, okay. He just left. Yeah, so he that, just that dropped person, it. Just that left. person probably has a story. Uh, you know, oh, stop, man. Like someone someone who doesn't look Muslim, you know what I mean? Uh, like, generally speaking, yeah. that's, that's a generalization because Islam is not stuck to a nation and it's not stuck to a race or ethnicity. Islam is for everyone. But generally speaking, people think they have a misconception that Muslims are brown. You know what I mean? Mm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, you know what I mean? So he You're might have... you Arab. 100% bro, 100%. Like, so he might have seen Musa. And then he recited... He recited Surah Al-Fatiha. And he's like, what? The point is, bro, like... I can imagine myself being in that situation. I would have freaked out, man. <laughs> yes. Bro, I would have freaked out, like, subhanAllah. Terrifying, man. You know? Yeah, but I didn't think about it until just there with you today. I didn't really, didn't really click, and then I remembered. It. I was like, ah, oh, no, maybe that had a bit of an effect on him. He probably has a story to <laughs> get him on the podcast. <laughs> this this crazy Irish guy walked in and was like, "Sorry, Subhanallah. So, uh, going back to the point where you mentioned doubt. Yeah. When you start practicing, and that is true. When you start practicing, especially if you're new, a lot of doubts start yeah. creeping. You know, there was this guy, his name is Tariq. He became a Muslim through Faisal. Faisal, he's doing dawah. He's in uh, Discover Islam Ireland. Yeah. He's doing dawah. Uh, Tariq, brother, that's Scottish. Uh, he started practicing. And bro, every single day, he was coming on doubts, 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 doubts. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, there was an answer for every question he asked. But the point is, when you don't have knowledge, you're going to have a lot of doubts. And the only way you're going to remove doubt is by knowledge. Because the more you know about something, the more, you're, the more certain you're going to be. So my advice to, to Musa would be, learn more, akhi. Learn more, brother. You know? And my advice to whoever that is a non-Muslim, wherever you're from, if you're watching this, trust me. Because I, I know, like, I, sometimes I, I go through the people that watch my yeah. stories, that like whatever content, and there's a lot of non-Muslims, people that I know from school specifically, you know what I mean? That went to school with us, you know? That, that always, always watch my yeah. content, you know what I mean? My message is to them, don't delay it, man. What's stopping you from accepting Islam? Is it the pressure from your parents? Look what, what Musa is going through. Read about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's the prophet. He's like, he's, he's the prophet of Islam, Sallallahu He's the last and final messenger. He's not the person who came with Islam, but he's the last and final messenger. And his own family fought him, bro. And his own tribe are gonna kill him. That's the biggest example. And he don't need to tell your family. Prophet Muhammad at the start of his da'wah, it was secret, bro. For a few years, I think it was for three years, his da'wah was secret. The da'wah of the Sahaba was secret. And, and as you said, you will be closer to the Sahaba than we would be. Because they were fought the same way you were fought. You know, and then the kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers of Quraysh, they were like, Muhammad came with a deen that, se that separated us from our own sons, from yeah. our own brothers. Do you understand what I'm yeah. trying to say? Same, exact same scenario you'll be going through. You know what I mean? And that may not be the, the, the same case for you, because I know Reaver Finn, he, he, revered, he became a Muslim, he's from uh, Klontarif, yeah. as far as I remember. He became a Muslim, bro, alhamdulillah, and his mom was with it, and his mom was supporting him all the way. You know, and there's a video that I shared recently on my story where a woman was like, a, a, she's an African American woman. Her yeah. son asked her, "What was it like when you found out I was Muslim?" I said, like, yeah. I, "I was devastated." Yeah. You know, but what are you like yeah, now? I might, I might become. You know what I mean? Yeah. She was like, "I'm happy now because you changed." You know, I seen the change, and she's like, "I, I might become Muslim." When myself. I see stuff like that, I'm like, "Oh, just 
Alhamdulillah, you're, you're so blessed, man, just yeah, to, for your parents to be like that. Now, even Ali Dawa, you know the way he, was, he says his dad was like real bad, but his mom was kind of cover for him. I just wish that was the case with me. Mm. But both my parents are just, just, yeah. What, what, what else can say than an order to be patient and learn more about your religion? Yeah. Be yeah. patient, learn more about your religion, and my brother, no matter what you do, no matter no, what no. you do, don't step away from the people that yeah. will bring you to closer to yeah. Allah subhanahu wa yeah. ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, a chapter of the Quran that we should recite every week. Yeah. It's sunnah to recite Friday, every week. Isn't it? Yeah, oh. Friday, uh, every Friday. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهًا And make yourself patient. How? By being around those who call upon their Lord in the night and in the day seeking his face or his, his, his pleasure. You know? And do not, ولا and do not obey. Oh, and do not, do not get distracted from them, running after the pleasures of the dunya, of this worldly life. You know what I mean? ولا تطع, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, and do not obey the one. ولا تطع من أغفلنا the one who we made his heart away from our remembrance, and he chased his desires, and his matter was ever in neglect. In neglectful neglectfulness yeah. you understand a lot of people they, they chase the dunya and I, I realized that the last year and a half just chasing you're just chasing material crap gucci armani all this kind of you know money you're just chasing it and chasing it and chasing it and there's no there's no point of chasing it because it just wrecks you you're you're, you're mentally exhausted spiritually exhausted and at the end of it you're gonna go to the same place and none of it's coming in with you you're so going true. into the ground and that's it do you know what I mean? Yeah. And when you realise that a lot of people don't realise that until they get sick or something, you know, they might get a bad the case of the flu, just for a light example. Yeah. Oh please God, just make me wear oh I'm in bits. Or if they get cancer, God, you know, it'll all protect them. I mean, then they say, Oh, give away everything, nothing matters anymore. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, I why is it that when we're sick nothing matters? Yeah. That's because bro, you know we are gonna go. And deep down we have we believe in our fitra and our our natural disposition is to believe in a God. That's why no matter where you're from, no matter what you believe in, when you're in a calamity, you're going to go back to the one God. You know what I mean? Naturally, you're going to, oh, please God, help me. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You know? Uh, so, uh, what was your question? So, I don't know, just, uh, just to add a little something there that when a doctor tells us we have two weeks to live, we listen to him and we trust him and yeah. we go with what he said. Allah's been telling us. Said. But when Allah tells you that you can die at any time. You don't listen. Oh, that's Adi, bro. Yeah, that's yeah, smart. Lots of time so why why do we put so much and emphasis to him? We return on, on, on a guy on a character with a white so care for not with a white coat and a yeah. coat, but we don't give importance to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yeah, that's like a that's something beneficial that I heard. That's actually deep. I was gonna say something, but I can't, what was it again? It was uh, no, like with with money and stuff like that. A lot of people they do degrees and mashallah like fair play to them, like they're doing whatever in UCD or Trinity and. I'll respect to them like you know if that's what they enjoy but a lot of people are only choosing them degrees because it gets them the big cash oh, flow man, that's true do you know what I mean like I I'm interested in a lot of things but I didn't do well in my leaving search so I'm not going to college and I've tried but it's just not going to happen so inshallah they will get me started with the barber and stuff and I'd just be happy with making a living that way I don't need to do anything special do you know what I mean I can just research stuff for knowledge for myself I'm interested in history and you know a lot of stuff like that so i just do it we, myself we live in the age of opportunity you know what i mean not, i'd just be happy with a decent living that can provide for my family i don't need a big six-figure job or something or a big important job something to keep you going a lot of people going. a lot of people chase after feeding their body yeah but they neglect their and soul it's ego as well you know what i mean it's egotistical. oh 100 bro you know 100%. i'm in trinity or i'm in ucd you know what i mean that's true that's true and i'm not i'm not disrespecting no i get you no no, no, that's no, no, not no. What I mean, makes you know? sense bro 100 makes sense well, like makes sense. you know and then also pleasing the parents comes in you know what i mean and having some sort of status comes in you understand what I'm trying to say? Doctor, a lot of the people doctor. that... <laughs> I heard people in bars before talking and they go, oh, what do you do? And say the fella's a carpenter or something or a barber. Oh, yeah. What do you do? Oh, I'm a financial banker. And you're just like, you know, you puff him up thinking he's great. And you're just like, mate. Carpenters make loads of money. That's well. just egotistical. Like, you, you're going into the ground one day and all that crap's coming with you. Bro. Do you know what? That actually reminds me of, I went to Newcastle before and this was, this actually is a huge, it was a huge disappointment. In Newcastle, bro, there's a Muslim cemetery there, a graveyard for Muslims. And I was disappointed, bro, because Islamically, according to the Sunnah, your grave should be max 
about level, uh, level. and and, and a, like leveled. So max, it, could, it should be like a an arms uh, a handspan. Sorry, up above the, above the ground. You know what I mean? And you shouldn't even know whose grave and whose grave that is in case that person has worshipped them besides Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, taken as an intercessor. You understand what I'm trying to say? But bro, I go into the graveyard and it says doctor, professor, something, something. What a big fancy thing! Mm. But he's dead. What's that gonna benefit him? Yeah. Like the guy is dead. Plus it's expensive real. as well. And bro, they spend money. Wallahi, they spend so much money on beautifying the grave. What's the point? Spend that money to give it to charity. Yeah. To benefit the person. That's what you know that person would want. Be- yeah, benefit. There you go. Because that's the only thing that's going to benefit him. What the hell is Use it for hajj. Professor? Go on hajj and pray for them. If the person didn't go hajj, go for hajj yeah. instead of him, you know? Oh, like dig a well. You know what I mean? For him, put it in his name. He continues to benefit from it as long as people continue to benefit from it. You understand? What's the are these, you know, flowery, you know, titles gonna benefit you in here? Once, once you chase this dunya, and you get no reward from it, but heartache, that's when you realize, out oh, here, it's meaningless. Yeah. It's, but not all people are fortunate to stop. Yeah, a lot of people keep going to, you know, even atheists, they're like, oh, why God, why when something bad happens to them, like, you know, if something affects them, financial loss or whatever, whatever it may be, you know, they go, oh, why God, why then something good happens? Ah, sure, look at Roll at the dice, look look at this and all this kind of stuff, you know. Oh, I'm lucky. You know what I mean? It ain't luck, pal. You know? Actually reminds me of a beautiful, beautiful poem. That's in Arabic. And it starts with لا تأسفن على الدنيا وما فيها فالموت لا شك يفنينا ويفنيها ومن يكن همه الدنيا ليجمعها فسوف يوما على رغم يخليها So he says, do not لا تأسفن على الدنيا Do not feel bad for the losses of the dunya and what's in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, for certainly, death will take you, will finish you, and will finish the dunya as well. You know? And whoever's, whoever's interest and main goal was the dunya, for sure, one day he's going to be forced out of it. He's going to yeah. be taken out of it by force. And you're gonna, when you're forced out of it, you're going to take nothing with you. Yeah. Nothing. There's you know a, what I mean? There's a good video uh, of... Inspiration of mine from the 70s, 80s, everyone will know Muhammad Ali. Yeah, and anyone ever see a speech? He was in Newcastle preparing to meet God. Yeah, yes. ever hear his yeah, speech? Yeah. Not just not, not just the explanation of why God is real, explanation of you sleep this amount of days, so yeah. this is it equals up to this amount of years being asleep throughout your life. You travel this amount, that equals to that. Yeah, you know, you work this amount. What do you do in between then? You have to prepare to meet God, you know, you retire or whatever. Throughout them three times, you have to make your not just for knowledge, not just the oh here look look what I know. Do you know what I mean? We were saying a few verses and all that. Yeah, look what I know. Put it on the chest. Just actually getting knowledge to know where you're going and what's going to happen, and preparing to meet your Creator because one day you will. And you want to say you know oh Lord, please forgive me I I should have done this but I didn't, or do you want you know have good deeds and you know good man that will get you into agenda one day inshallah be all. I grant the but you know that kind of, you know, and it's a great video. Everyone should watch it. It's called uh, Muhammad Ali preparing to meet God. Preparing to, it's a beautiful video. Yeah, it's a, br- it's a beautiful, beautiful video. Beautiful, beautiful he was video. an he was an absolute inspiration. He was, like, he love, was, love he him. Was. Yeah, very articulate, very logical person. Yeah, for someone who was uh, considered really mentally reasoned. retarded when he done his skills stuff, he actually was. He, he the IQ, you know, the IQ score he did in America. Yeah. He scored so far below that he was actually they would have considered him like uh, mentally <laughs> retarded, like <laughs> and. First, like he could have been beaten any poet, never mind Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he had it up there, he was up there. Inshallah. He had a way with words. Mashallah, mashallah. Look, do you have anything else? With my, I'm, just, I'm just weak on sinning, like uh, my my tests and my sins and stuff like that. I'm like, is it really that big, or is my desires as does it? Uh, what I'm trying to say. Is it that important to me? Because like Moa says, that if a doctor told me to add two weeks to live, to live I'll, I'll do everything. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me that I'm going to die. I remember there's a time in which the man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, when is, the, uh, when is the hour? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't rip, answer his question directly. He said, what have you prepared for? Now that's the question I have to ask myself. What have I prepared? So I'm gonna start thinking about that because when I you said walking to the uh, going to, for waking up for Fajr, 
and holding a cup to do what do. What's my excuse not waking up for Fajr on time or quicker or not be lazy when no one's stopping me? You know what I mean? So Allah's going to ask, ask me what I did with my time. You know what I mean? So that, that's a terrifying thought, especially if I'm not being pu- pulled down. Mm. You know what I mean? So I really benefited from what you told me. And I hope Allah makes it easy for that's you. That's what this was about. Yeah. I just wanted, if, I, if there is anyone, you know, Muslim or non-Muslim or even just reverts who are going through a tough time, just I hope you get some sort of reassurance mm-hmm. from what I've told you. Do you know what I mean? No matter how bad it gets, a lot yeah. is always there. Because do you know what I mean? To come back, always there. To come back what to what I said again, just that I remember. Yeah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, just because you say la ilaha illa, just say just because you say, oh, I'm a Muslim, yeah. doesn't mean you won't be tested. You know what I mean? People, people kind of a lot of people say, oh, I made the war, but Allah hasn't given it to mm-hmm. me. Allah is the best of planners, man. Mm-hmm. You will get it. When it's the right time, and if it is good for you, then you'll get it. If it's not, you get something better. Yeah. Do you know what 100%. I mean? So, there's actually a nice quote by just Imam say, Allah, Allah. Allah. Yeah, it. there's a quote, nice quote by Imam Nuqim. He says, "Whenever I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for something, and He grants it for me, I get happy. But when I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for something, and He doesn't grant it for me, I get even yeah. happier. Why? He says because Allah sees what I don't see, and Allah chooses the best for me." You understand? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I know that's when I realized what I asked for is not suitable for me in that time. And he gave a very nice example. He said, imagine, imagine an ant on a carpet, mm. right? And the ant wants to get to his destination a piece of a piece of sugar, right? But that ant doesn't know if it went to that route. You know what I mean? It's going to fall in water, whatever. It's going to die. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it wants to take that route, but something like an obstacle comes in its way and prevents it through going through the easier route. Yeah. And she has to take a longer <coughs> route to get to the to, to, to his destination. You understand? The ant may see that whatever that dropped in its way as an obstacle. Yeah. But in fact, it's not an obstacle. It's a blessing. Yeah. You understand? You know? A lot of people when they're when something good happens, every, you know, everyone's like, mashallah. You know, Alhamdulillah. Oh, God, oh, God. But what you should say is when something bad happens, you should just say, Alhamdulillah, mashallah, qadr Allah. Because it is, it's the qadr of Allah. You know, yeah. if something bad happens, you'll say, Alhamdulillah. Because it was meant to happen. You know, even if you think it was bad, it was a le- it was a test or it was a lesson in some way. So don't fail that test just because you're disappointed or angry or upset. You know what I mean? Just go through with it. That's all. That's all I can offer. That's the only advice I can say, really. It's been a pleasure having you on, bro. I really benefited, man. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Good. And we should definitely stick with each other because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says we're stronger with each other, just like a wall that is strengthened by each brick. Trust me, I won't be going anywhere. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Zakum Allah khair and we hope, inshallah, that you've benefited. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.